Hello, welcome to Quackalope, thank you for being here. Today, I want to talk to you about a brand new game coming to Kickstarter, which already thousands of people are paying attention to, and it's based off of this comic book, The Stuff of Legend. Now, this video isn't going to be a preview video. I do have a prototype copy coming in, but it's down in Maryland, and I'm here in Board Game Co. Studio. Instead, I'm going to be talking about how they've translated a comic book, this whole series into a board game tabletop experience, a grand adventure that allows you to take part in that journey. You see, this last weekend we were down at Gen Con where I had a chance to view, witness, and demo the stuff of legend. And they're doing some stuff really, really cool. Along with that, I picked up this book for the very first time ever and delved into the world of, well, the toys, of this nightmare kind of closet experience. Basically, you take Toy Story and you flip it on its head and make it brutal and unimaginable. That's what you're getting here in this book. So this video is going to be an introduction into the core concepts of the narrative and the narrative choices, and also to those of you that are fans of the Stuff of Legend already, I'm going to talk about what this game does that'll make you feel like you're flipping through the pages of this novel. So, with that being said, the stuff of legend, the narrative, is going to be, and I'll do my best to be spoiler free, but the stuff of legend is going to be a exploration into the idea of lost toys. A narrative that you've seen other times, with stuff like Toy Story, which I already referenced, but it's the idea of a young boy who slowly is growing out of the toys that he normally plays with. They're getting put into the closet, they're being left on shelves, they're not being engaged with the same way. And they get tucked into the darkness, the forgotten, the lost land of toys, that children's movie with all the claymation figures that we all watched growing up. And the boogeyman, the darkness, the embodiment of this sort of nefarious creature that's willing to play with the toys even when they're left unloved and unplayed with by the boy, starts swelling into the ranks, gaining power with each toy that is left alone until finally the darkness is able to capture the boy, capture his dog, and the toys that he's still engaged with, the ones left up on his mantle place, have to journey into the closet and do their very best to rescue, well, their human. They want him back. That's the game you're playing. You're working together cooperatively to go through all of the different scenes and locations here in this book and explore them face the challenges and threats, go on this grand adventure and work together as a team, each with your own personality and abilities and skills, and do your best to get the boy out of the darkness before it's too late, before he's lost or the boogeyman takes control and swallows everything. Here's the issue. This novel does not pull punches from betrayal to death to moments where you think everything's going to work out fine and then suddenly things fall apart. The Stuff of Legend is for mature audiences, right? Teenagers should be the people reading this book, not young children sitting down with the graphic novel. This book allows for people to stab each other in the back, delves into human conflict and the personalities and emotions that we all have, and does so through the lens of these characters, these toys that the boy still plays with. You see, every single one has its own narrative pathway, its own journey. Every single one has its own struggles and ideas of mortality that it's facing, the same challenges that we face as humans. And when they're brought into this world, when they're brought into the darkness and go into the closet to try to rescue the boy, they become the thing that they are. A teddy bear transforms into a giant raging bear. You have a pig, a little piggy bank that turns into a pig in a dress suit and tie, I think. Or maybe he's naked. I'm not entirely sure. You have the sergeant or the general. You have the ballerina, the princess. You have a toy duck that you pull on a string that suddenly can scout and fly over the countryside. And you have the dog, who, well, remains a dog because the dog's already a thing by the time it's pulled in. And they all have their own path that they have to overcome. That's one of the things that makes this novel so fascinating. And it's one of the things that they've bridged into the board game that makes it a compelling thing to play. You see, 
Every chapter of this book is filled with moments where you're not sure who's on the team of the boy or the team of the darkness. Who's going to work in favor of the party getting the boy out? Or who's going to delay or hurt or cause pain or betray? And you'll be surprised at who makes those decisions at what point throughout the novel. And if you've read that, you already know. And that's exactly what they've done in the board game. You see, the board game is going to be a semi-cooperative game where as you journey through this world, as you work together as a team, allegiances can shift. The person who you thought was your ally just a turn before may actually be trying to delay your path, to lead you through the wrong exit. And then again, they could change back. So let's talk about how you take a graphic novel and you pull it onto the table. Well, first, let's start with the idea of the artwork and the theme and the principles here in the book. I mean, I can flip back here to some of these last pages and just show you the incredible artwork uh, that I'm sure a lot of you are already paying attention to that for me is sort of the core of the game. The darkness moving like a puppet, moving pieces across the board, the fear and horror and transformation that's taken place, the tangled vines wrapping around them, this is, well, what the book and the game is about. And so you start with an incredible theme, with an amazing set of world building and a lot of character. And they have imbued every aspect of this board game with that. With the custom, beautiful artwork, with the comic book scripts, with the narrative and the discussion. Right? And so as you play, you get to re-explore, you get to open up this book once more where half of the joy of flipping through a comic book is seeing the incredible art and the illustrations that guide the narrative along. So you start with that, and then you start bridging over to mechanics. When you think of the stuff of legend, you think of an adventuring party. So you're gonna start as a cooperative game. But then, like I was just previously saying, it's full of moments of betrayal and backstabbery. It's full of uh, the boogeyman corrupting the party and twisting your mind to think that maybe, just maybe, the boy doesn't have your best interest in mind. Maybe he doesn't want to play with you anymore. Maybe he's moved on to other toys. And you're meeting and encountering as you journey through this story all the other discarded, lost remnants of his youth. And they're talking about the pain and the loss and what they've had to overcome themselves. And so you have an adventuring party and you have a world that's established. As you go over to the Kickstarter page and you take a look at the map, you'll see all these different transposed locations and areas that you're going to be exploring through. And they're all things that I've had the chance to see as I've read through and flipped through this book uh, from the zoo to the forest, to, of course, uh, and I'm completely blanking on the name, town of, the town of Hopscotch, to the beach where you initially land, every single thing that you see here in the novel is first established there. You get to decide how you explore, what choices you make as you go on this grand journey, just like you're going through the story of the book here. Following up with that, there's going to be a lot of hidden secrets and clues, things that emphasize or allow you to bring your knowledge of the book and just celebrate it a little bit more on the page. Some of the graphics and icons hint at stuff that you'd only know if you read the novel. Now, I do want to make it very clear, you don't need to know the stuff of legend in order to play this game and have a really, really great experience with it. I think it enhances the gameplay. I think knowing the story allows you to relish and experience it in a different way but i highly recommend the game even without the knowledge of the comic book in the first place after all that's where i came i came not from the comic book i came from the game to start with and read the comic book in response to it and it's given me a little bit of a deeper understanding i do have my note card over here i've talked about the hidden trader mechanic i've talked about the art and the theme and how you bridge all of that onto the table but they also have, from all these different towns, they have events and narrative choices which are going to start emphasizing and reflecting the narrative choices that are made here. Hopscotch, a town of games and broken rules, is going to be a location where you're not quite sure what's going to happen. 
who are you going to be facing off against? Is the mayor going to show up in your campaign? Are you going to have to fight and overcome and escape? Uh, will you end up, you know, in any of the different conundrums the squad finds themselves in as they journey through? So they've done that. They've established the nature of the game. They've established the puzzle that you're trying to solve. But then how do you have a game that allows for shifting alliances, allows for that narrative uh, semi-cooperative experience? Well, you start off with a signifier. You start off with, first off, the general's rifle, which rotates around the game state, allowing you to break ties or make a decision on behalf of the team, a really essential part to this gameplay. And every time you utilize it, it moves from one player to another, always being the icon of, are you working in our favor? The game also times and drives itself based off of the hand of cards you have and through a cycle of discarding in order to do something good for your teammates. But every time you utilize your cards, every time you spend that resource, you're also escalating the game state. So you have this balance. You have all these different levers you can push, both as the good person and the bad person, in order to delay or drive, discard a whole hand of good cards, but look someone in the eye and say, I'm doing this on your behalf. But what they don't know is you just skipped a whole round of the game. You just escalated. You just made the boogeyman act again, earlier, quicker, more ferociously than he would have otherwise. And finally, one of the cool things about this is in the comic, in the book, no one's loyalty is certain. Except for maybe the dog. Either way, no one's loyalty is certain. You can question everyone at every stage, and so there is this dance. There is this shifting puzzle as the boogeyman infects and questions and changes. And you can do that in this game as well. You see, there's cards that allow you to start changing or manipulating who you want to be. And there's a dead card always in play, a card that you could find out the information for to give yourself a little bit of an upper hand, but a card that may be the villain allowing everyone to potentially be on the same team and still have these threads of distrust sewed within the fabric of what you're playing. When it comes to a semi-cooperative game, it's a puzzle that establishes itself in a way that I, I don't typically enjoy. I don't love semi-cooperative games, but because this one gives you so much agency over the way that that role ebbs and flows, the way that you gain information and push the narrative to end game, the way that even if someone is discovered early on, they can do some trickery with some of their cards or they can swap out with that dead card, that roll card that's always out of play, allowing them to say, oh no, guys, I'm on your team now. I've solved it, I promise. And everyone else has to make a decision. Do we trust them? Well, why not? Why wouldn't they? Or, do we try to find out that information? Do we still act with deceit? And what do we do if we are proven right? What do we do if we're proven wrong? What have we just spent our energy and time doing? The way that it threads the narrative of who the hidden traitor might be and how that role can rotate as you play the game, making victory condition and win condition shift from point to point, it reflects so much the dynamic that the team the group of friends has as they journey through the stuff of legend. Following back over here to the note card, I want to talk about the darkness card, the boogeyman cards. You see, the boogeyman is always this growing force, and the more toys that are neglected, the more voices and people that he can get to his side, the more power he has over the boy and over the world itself, the more control he has. And that's true in this game as well. You start bringing that puzzle into a little AI system that operates and manages the time. You either don't escape or escape through the wrong exit or, meaning you're trapped, the boy gets down and is lost in the darkness before you're able to rescue him and escape. If that happens, you've lost the game. Well, I was talking about the hand of cards you have. As you play through, you're cycling those cards out of your hand to do actions, to spend resources, to help opponents or hurt opponents and or allies. And as you're doing that, you're driving endgame. You see, every time someone cycles through their hand of cards, they're going to be drawing a boogeyman card. And a boogeyman card has a status effect. Well, they're actually gonna be flipping a coin first. And either the boy moves down or you draw a boogeyman card. And the boogeyman card has a status effect, a highly thematic, world-corrupting or changing thing. 
swapping cards, shifting the boy down even faster, flipping the coin multiple times, discarding cards from your hand, all army men, all, all militia moving closer into your ranks, things just start falling apart. Add three event cards underneath the town or city location you're in, meaning you're going to have to deal with a cacophony of opponents. And that feels accurate. The more time you spend, the more deceit and narrative runs that happen, the game starts escalating beyond your control to the point where everyone could lose. You have to work as a team, you have to overcome the boogeyman, even though you know some of you may betray you. Even though there's a chance that someone may not be on your side, you have to continue journeying in together. So, it's the darkness and the boogeyman uh, track. Now let's talk about the different character abilities. Every character has a positive and negative trait to how they operate, which is true in the book as well. For instance, our friend the duck here. Courageous and loyal and brazen, with the ability to scout and fly over vast areas to see what threats are out there and prevent them from coming to you. And also, a bit hot-headed, a bit too quick to act, a bit flustered when the time comes, when pressure mounts. And so there's consequences to that as well. An act of cycling through or discarding cards way too quickly. That's one of the really cool things about this. Every character has their own positives and negatives and depending on who you're playing as is the team, you can really feel the type of dynamic you'd have when you're working through this story. As one character branches off or different people are left to fend for themselves, you understand how this party would operate within that context, right? What if you're just traveling with the pig, the bear, and the dog? Well, that's a very different party than if you're traveling with the jester, the duck, and the princess. That dynamic allows you to play as those characters, and those puzzle pieces that you're locking together work together really well, but are always different. And it changes for who your ally is to who your enemy is. There's different ways they can cost and hurt the party while still pretending being helping. Just like the pig can sow deceit and lead people astray, or the bear can be aggressive and vengeful, it's true in the board game in the same way that it's true here in the comic book. So, that's my overview. That's my initial impressions. The book is fantastic. It is full of incredible artwork and story and adventure and well worth checking out. But I think the game does this grand adventure justice. It talks about and tells a story that is uh, epic in proportion. If you like that twist on Toy Story, if you like that twist on sort of a dystopian toy house, a group of unloved refugees, this will let you be that. So, we're going to be bringing gameplay to the channel here in about a week. Uh, I'm really excited to be able to get to the table and show it off. But for now, I just wanted to share. I wanted to talk about a book that I'd recently read and how I think they're doing it justice on the table. So, thank you for watching. Thank you for being here. Let me know if you're going to be swinging over and checking this one out or backing it. Whatever the case, whatever you do, remember to do the important thing. Get out and play some games. We'll see you next time. Thank you.